With that, I also want to now introduce and welcome my friend and colleague, Congressman Mike Kaplan. Mike is serving in his ninth term in Congress representing the 7th District of Massachusetts, which includes the city of Somerville, half of Cambridge, approximately 70% of Boston, and I think it's a plus 31 Democratic district. Prior to serving in Congress, Mike was a mayor of Somerville for nine years. He serves as a member of the House Ethics Committee, a really tough committee. Uh, given you no, 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 not everybody knows all this. The Committee on Financial Services and the Committee on Transportation Infrastructure, where he is a very powerful voice advocating on behalf of the Commonwealth and its transportation needs. In 2012, his efforts on the committee led to Massachusetts being one of only four states to receive an increase in highway funding in the multi year funding bill. And more recently, he secured a $1 million commitment. The Federal Transportation Administration for the Green Line Extension. He's known for speaking his mind, and I'm sure we'll hear this morning, and I have always valued his remarkable experience in his candor. Congressman Mike Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Congressman. I am not going to try to upstage the general, right? For those of you who haven't met him, he's a great guy. He remembers exactly. Exactly where he comes from, uh, and I will tell you that he really cherishes his Massachusetts roots. And I, I didn't hear the list, but I wish I had. I know that there are many, many people at the top ranks of the military in this country that hail from Massachusetts. All of them I have met when I travel abroad, I try to bring the Red Sox hat. Um, they always do it. When I do, they, they appreciate it. And I will tell you that uh, they do us proud in many, many different ways. And I, I'm really glad to see them. I haven't seen them since I became the big shot. Um, I don't know exactly what to tell you, except welcome to Washington. Most of you know exactly what's going on down here. And I, I, I guess I'm not supposed to tell you this, but we're pretty much doing nothing. Um, <laughs> I expect that we will continue to do nothing, and then maybe after the election, come back and maybe, maybe, maybe do something. Um, thanks for coming. <laughs> um, the truth is, it's, it's a tough year. I, I guess I just want to take a minute explain why I think we're not doing much. People think it's because Democrats and Republicans don't get along, we don't like each other, we don't talk to each other. That's not right. I mean, the media loves to play it that way because it is a nice simplistic view to do. Um, and I understand, but you know, like your lives, our lives, and the reality we live, it's not that simple. You know, what has happened, this is my estimation, people can disagree with it if they want. In the last several years, now this, the country has always been divided on deep, important, philosophical differences. These are not small differences. You may think they are. You may think we're all the same, we hear it all the time. We are not all the same. We don't see the world the same. It's not because they're bad and we're good. It's just we have different values. In general, especially the Massachusetts delegation, well, I would say we're monolithic, but we come close to it. We actually see the value in government having a role in providing health care for everyone. Now, how to get there? Fair question. We see that value. We fight for it. We struggle to get it. We see a value in the government having a role in providing senior citizens with housing. We see a value in making sure the senior citizens don't have to go back. And there's plenty of people in this room that are old enough to remember the days when senior citizens really, honest to God, without an exaggeration, not a news story, but a truth, had to choose between food and heat, had to choose between rent and health care. Now, if you think that's wonderful, good old days, you have a different view of the world than I do. I don't. I lived with people who had to make those struggles. Many of you did too. Some of them might have been your relatives or your loved ones. Now, I understand that doesn't make people bad, doesn't make them anything. We just have serious differences of opinion. And what's ended up happening, in my estimation, is that the other side. There are many, many good people that can make compromises. In fact, I see one right here. Matt Clumber is a great guy. Now, we don't see the world the same, but we can do business together. We can find a way to compromise. Unfortunately, in my estimation, he can't say this, I can. The other side has elected about 50 people that came here on the promise. This isn't, it shouldn't be a surprise. When they ran for office, they promised to shut down government. They promised to not compromise. They say, here are my values, and the problem is people who compromise their values. I have values too, but of course I compromise. 
Unless, of course, you will let me amputate. Then I don't have to compromise. Other than that, I compromise with my wife, I compromise with my kids, I compromise when I was in the business world. Every day, every one of you does, every minute of every day. Yet somehow it's a value to some elected officials that compromise is a bad thing. And when they do that, that's fine. If it was just 50 people, fine. I would say, go sit in the corner, be pure, and sit down and get out of the way. Let the adults do business. The problem is the primary system. I come from a district no Republican has ever lived before. Well, maybe not ever, but not for a long, long time. If I get defeated, it's going to be by another Democrat. And if a Democrat's going to run against me, they're probably going to say, I am pure, and Mike Capuano is just a political tool. He's made those terrible compromises. He voted for a flawed health care bill. He voted for flawed appropriation bills, and on and on and on. And that's the truth. I wouldn't have voted for, I wouldn't have drafted that health care bill. I wouldn't have drafted almost anything that I voted on, but that's not how it works. When you went through a new contract in your business, do you get to draft it alone or have to negotiate? We have to negotiate. Sometimes with other Democrats who don't see the world exactly the same way I do. Sometimes with Republicans. Sometimes with the President. Sometimes with the Senate. And on and on and on. That's the system. It's always been the system. It's not a new problem. It's been here since day one. But when all of a sudden, which I think it is relatively all of a sudden, in the last 10 years, it has become a political positive to say, I don't compromise. And we, the American people, vote for enough of those people. And then they can generate enough political interest to generate hate, to generate deep, vilifying hate. If you have the audacity to compromise, that scares the bejesus out of a lot of people. A lot of people start saying, eh, maybe I can't compromise. In my estimation, that's where we are. When we get out of this, we get out of this when there are enough people in this country that understand that compromise is life. It is life. I don't care which government program, state, local, or federal, you like, if you personally could draft that law, Social Security, health care, whatever it is, doesn't matter what it is, you would have done it differently than it is. But none of us are the emperor. So, we are stuck here right now. We're not doing much. We are unlikely to do anything. And if we do, it'll be peaceful. It'll be kick the can down the road here, kick the can down the road. Maybe once in a while we get something done. Until we break the attitude that compromise is a sin. And then we can get back to business. Now again, I guarantee you, if we get back to business, you won't love everything we do. Neither will I. But at least we'll be able to address the problems of the world. Again, whether you like or don't like the health care bill, I haven't met anybody from Massachusetts, at least, who thought it was a bad idea to have a serious adult conversation of how do we get 20% of America healthy. Not the, not the result. I can criticize the result as well as anybody. I would love to redraft certain portions of it, but I'm not repealing it. Why am I not repealing it? Because I've spent time in an emergency room. If any of you can go to any emergency room in Massachusetts or any place in this country and sit there for 20 minutes, especially when you're engaged with a loved one, just sit there on your own. If you can pick the 20% of the people who walk in and tell them to walk out unsolved, unsaw, unaddressed, little Johnny Ramirez with a broken elbow from the Little League field, Mrs. Jones who fell down and broke her hip, you don't have health insurance, go home. If you can do that, then you can tell me we should repeal the health care. Other than that, I would ask you to get to work with me and with Nikki and with Matt and others to fix it, to make it work. It's a complicated issue. It's an expensive issue. Which one of you ever went to the emergency room with a loved one and said, my loved one is sick, please give them the cheap stuff? None of you ever did that. You said, fix them. I don't care what it costs. You never said give them four MRIs. How many of you actually even know what an MRI is? I don't. They just know they put you in a the machine, they take a picture, and they say good, bad, and different. 
You didn't ask for that fourth MRI, you said fix it. Now, if you're one of those people who can walk away with your loved one and say, give me the cheap stuff, again, I think then you have the moral authority to tell me to walk away from health care. That's not what we want in Massachusetts. I went on too long, I know that, but you know, if you give a politician a microphone, you're gonna pay a penalty. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I think I'm going to stop. We're going to pass it in. You see if you can repair all the damage that you see.